What's going on everybody, C4 here, and today we are going to be talking about the 2018 draft. We are now in the aftermath of the draft, and I know some of you guys are waiting for the grades video. That is going to come Monday and or Tuesday. I don't know if I'm going to put both videos up on one day or wait a little bit. Um, but I'm going to give you a little sneak peek, a little hit up of what that list is going to entail, what those grades are going to entail. So I'm going to go round by round and give you the best and worst picks by round with a little bit of justification. Now this is just a little little teaser, a little something that to get some quick input back on the draft from me. Um, and you know, I was as unbiased as possible. Put it this way, I have one good pick for Philly, one bad pick for Philly, maybe kind of trending towards two bad picks for Philly, two worst picks in a round to my Philadelphia Eagles. So uh, that's number one thing when people watch my videos, like, oh, he's gonna be biased towards the Eagles. Not the case. Come on, have more faith in me than that. So. Jumping in at the first round, I have two picks that fall into the best category. And in the best category, uh, obviously there's going to be a little bit of personal opinion on how I rate the prospect, but ultimately I'm trying to go with the best value. So first up is that pick number 10, Josh Rosen falling to the Arizona Cardinals. Are you kidding me? I still think to this day, Josh Rosen's the best quarterback in this year's draft class day one. Doesn't have the highest ceiling, but I think in terms of what one of these quarterbacks could I just throw to the fire and see which one could you know have the least amount of of learning curve and the most amount of early success, it probably would be Josh Rosen. And I'm not even that big of a fan of Josh Rosen personally. Like I like Baker Mayfield and Lamar Jackson more, but the fact that the Arizona Cardinals were a team that was on the outside looking in for getting a quarterback in this year's draft class, and they didn't really have to give up a whole lot to move up to 10 and get Josh Rosen, who was kind of free falling, uh, that's really good value. Regardless, of, even if Josh Rosen is not the best, even though if he gets a little bit of playing time, be it via a Sam Bradford injury, or they just give him playing time later on the season, even if he doesn't look spectacular, the fact that they didn't have to give up an uh, arm and a leg to move up, it's not that bad. Not, it could have been much worse. And the next one is a little surprising, but I am going with Calvin Ridley at 26 to the Atlanta Falcons. I think this is kind of a, looking at an offensive perspective. The rich getting richer. The Falcons are upgrading from Taylor Gabriel to Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley was probably the best wide receiver in this year's draft class. I mean, him and DJ Moore, uh, or maybe Cortland Sutton on the outside looking in. But I think if you had to give, you know, you're going in a race, 100 meter dash, and you're freezing the camera to see who just barely crosses the line first, it's probably going to be Calvin Ridley. And the fact that you got that value at 26, you're going to be able to pair him with Matt Ryan, MVP winning quarterback. You get to pair him with Julio Jones, the second best wide receiver in football. Is Okay, here's a question. Everyone knows Antonio Brown's number one. Is DeAndre Hopkins? right in that mix right now for number two with Julio Jones. I think it's a lot closer than people think. But anyway, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, and then you got the two talented running backs, Matt Ryan. I think that's a great pick there for the Atlanta Falcons. Worst picks, we're going just straight up for a pick at 28, Terrell Edmonds going to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, I don't think Terrell Edmonds is a bad prospect. I'm actually pretty sure I had him mention it in my Philadelphia Eagles mock draft. That was in the fourth round, however. I feel like in a it's an absolute reach. The biggest reach in the first round for me was Terrell Edmonds, I think. Worst case scenario, he's a late second round pick. Personally, I feel third, fourth round is where you get a guy. Because I, I, I do see a lot of similarities between his game and Jabril Peppers. Great athletes prototypical size but as far as their coverage ability they still have a little ways to go and I, I feel like if you're getting a guy in the first round that's a project you know you want to hope that they're not you know you can they can still get some meaningful rotational snaps whereas a guy like Terrell Edmonds I, I could just very well see him playing the majority of the season on special teams as he refines his coverage ability now as far as an athlete if they can get him to learn sooner than later uh, his athletic ability is elite so, I mean, this could very well emerge to not be a worse pick if the Pittsburgh Steelers can develop them quickly. So I'm not ruling out that possibility. But as of just grading the draft, uh, that's an eyebrows razor. And number two is Marcus Davenport at pick 14. Now, this is nothing against Davenport the prospect. I think, you know, everyone knows he is a project-type player with a very high ceiling. You give up two first-round picks for an edge rusher, you're going to make the worst list. That's You give up two first-round picks for a quarterback, and that's it. You give up two first-round picks, maybe if you want Saquon Barkley, if you, and you desperately are a running back away from winning the Super Bowl. You don't give up two first-round picks for a project edge rusher. Going into the second round, we are first going to Harold Landry. Pick 41 to the Tennessee Titans. He was a guy I had mocked to the Titans in my in my first round. The fact that he was sitting there at 41, they did have to trade up. Uh, they, you know, they kind of depleted their war chest of picks to trade up, but this is a home run pick for the Tennessee Titans who don't have a lot of holes, and now you get a guy that's going to be a rotational edge rusher. Yes, he's not a complete product. Yes, he's not going to set the edge. Yes, he's not good against the run, 
but for what he's going to be utilized as as a rookie, and that's rotating in with Brian Arakpo and or Derek Morgan, you could not find a better fit for the Tennessee Titans, so that is a great move. And we're also going to talk about Darius Geis at 59. Now, I know there's a lot of controversy about him and the Philadelphia Eagles. Is it true? Is it not true? Um... And yes, I did want him with the Philadelphia Eagles because now, just because he's in Washington doesn't drastically change my opinion of him. Uh, maybe a little bit about the off-field stuff. But he's still top 25 player if you're ranking all pound for pound in this year's draft class. And the Redskins a team that desperately needs another running back to compliment Chris Thompson. 59, that's, that's great. I don't think they even had a trade-up. I think he fell to them at 59. So uh, that is a very nice pickup there for the Washington Redskins. Uh, worst picks, first up, I have Austin Corbett at pick 33 to the Cleveland Browns. I just feel more so that Corbett was one of the more sleeper, underrated offensive linemen because he gives you versatility to play guard and tackle. However, at 33, I think it was a little bit of reach. I think there was better names on the board. So, I, you know, for the fact that they had that massive amount of picks that the Cleveland Browns could use, I feel like Corbett, you know, maybe could have been weighted to the third round, you know? And then also we're going to talk about Breland Speaks at pick 46 to the Kansas City Chiefs. This is their first pick, and they get a <laughs> a guy that I had as a fourth rounder. I had him as a fourth rounder, late third. They get him early second. Uh, I know a lot of Chief fans are up. This is probably on Twitter. I usually judge by on Twitter, too, when I, when I make up these lists, what people were tagging me, fans of certain teams, going, what are they thinking? And I think I got more what the fucks from Kansas City Chiefs fans about this Breland Speaks pick. So uh, that also speaks to the badness of it. Uh, going to the third round, best pick, Justin Reed at 68 to the Houston Texans. This is a guy that was considered a fringe first-round talent. And for a team like Houston that did not have a whole lot of picks, money. I can definitely see big things in the future with Justin Reed and Honey Badger. Uh, another pick I'm go throwing out to Mason Rudolph at 76 of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think Mason Rudolph has as good of a chance as any of the not-first-round quarterbacks to be potentially the best quarterback that emerges from this class. Now, it is certainly a long shot because Darnell has a high ceiling. Allen has a high ceiling. You got Rosen. You got Mayfield. You got Lamar Jackson. But I think, you know, those are the guys everyone knew. They were the premier guys. You're going to have to give up a lot, most likely, to get them. Or you had to suck and have a high pick. The fact that the Pittsburgh Steelers definitely need to think about life beyond Ben Roethlisberger. They get another guy that has almost that first-round talent. I, I think it's an excellent pick here for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So credit that. They're making up a little bit for the Edmonds reach. Uh, worst two picks. Going back to the Texans again. Jordan Akins, tight end from US, uh, UCF. Did not test particularly well. I'm pretty sure, unless I was a, it was like a, a typo. He ran like a five something forty, and everyone keeps talking about the athletic ability. I know he's like a baseball player or something like that. Either way, just more so the fact that Ian Thomas from Indiana was still on the board. Chris Herndon from Miami was still on the board, and you go with a reach like Aikens. I thought that was a bad reach. Uh, also, we have Tracy Walker at pick 82 to the Detroit Lions. Had him as a fifth round pick. This is again more my personal grades versus where the team actually took him. Uh, I thought that was a big reach for the Detroit Lions, and not really a position in need at safety. Going to the fourth round, we're first up starting with Anthony Everett at pick 118 to the Baltimore Ravens. Ravens always love their Alabama Crimson Tide. It worked out last year with Marlon Humphrey. He looks pretty damn good. I think I got like Anthony Everett. I personally had a late second, mid third round grade on him. The fact they got him at 118, just a really good value pick. Another one, Josh Sweat at 130 to my Philadelphia Eagles. If you look at his spider chart, athletically speaking, he's literally like a carbon copy of Jadavion Clowney. Now, I'm not saying he's the next Jadavion Clowney, but anytime you get an athlete like that, that did have some good production. Struggled staying healthy, but you would see flashes of that. It's not just a guy that hasn't been able to put it all together, and you're hoping as like an ultimate project type player, you can do that. No, this is a guy that had big time flashes. I think he had seven sacks to close up the season last year for uh, Florida State. So I think that's a good pick for my Philadelphia Eagles, and the rich get richer on the defensive line. Uh, two worst picks. First up, we have at 109, Troy Apke to Washington, White Lightning. Written like the most, uh, my jaw was dropped when he ran his 40 yard dash. I think Deion Sanders said some low key racist stuff about that. Uh, but he was a guy that was projected seventh undrafted free agent, more so a, a really, really big time project player that might be able to crack a roster as a special teamer. Fourth round, woof. Uh, also, we have Rick Leonard, 127 to the New Orleans Saints. This is a converted defensive player, now playing tackle. Again, project, these are guys you see going in the sixth, seventh round, not the fourth round. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of what the Saints did in their draft this year. Moving on to the fifth round, best pick I'm throwing up. I got two here. At first, I got Maurice Hurst at 140 to the Oakland Raiders. Just great value. He might not ever be able to play football with that heart condition, but if he can get past getting a guy that's a legitimate first-round talent in the fifth round, money. Also, Jamarco Jones at 168 to Seattle. We need to applaud Seattle when they actually draft an offensive lineman. And I think a guy like Jamarco Jones could have gone, you know, late third, early, you know, or late second 
to you know late third, somewhere in that range. So the fact that he's sitting there at five, that was a good value pick for the Seattle Seahawks, who once again looked like for the majority of the draft, they were ignoring some of the top offensive line prospects. Uh, the worst pick in the fifth round, I just have Daniel Carlson, the kicker, at 167 in Minnesota. Now, he is the best kicker in the class. By the time you trade up, you give up assets to move and get a kicker. A little suspect. Going to the sixth round, we have two good picks. First up, at 179, we have Perry Nickerson, the corner from Tulane, going to the New York Jets. Uh, I was really disappointed. He's here in the sixth. I was really disappointed that my Philadelphia Eagles didn't get him in the fourth round. We went with Devontae Maddox. I think Perry Nixon, great speed, had good protection at Tulane. I think he's going to get a lot of meaningful snaps for the Jets this year as a rookie. Uh, also, we have Equinemius St. Brown at 207 going to the Green Bay Packers. Yes, he's a project-type player, but the fact that he's 6'5 and has great speed and he's really tough to judge this game because Notre Dame is just dog shit at quarterback, I think sixth round is a tremendous value spot to get a guy with a very high ceiling. Worst two picks I have first up at 184, Marcel Harris, the safety going to San Francisco. Just because he's a Gator, he like didn't play last year. He's always injured, and when he did play, he did not look anything special. So that's more so just as a Gator. I was very surprised that he got drafted. He was one of those guys maybe can make on his undrafted free agent. The fact they invested a pick, a little bit of a head-scratcher. And then we're going to talk about Eagles, Matt Pryor, 206, tackle from TCU. Uh, Philadelphia got him. I was just really surprised with that pick, man. I thought that there's better tackles on the board, guys with higher ceilings. But he just kind of fits the mold of what our coach wants. And hey, when you're Super Bowl champions, when you're Super Bowl champions and you're a team that had as much injuries as they did and their depth was able to step up, you got to trust the process. Then finishing up here in the seventh round, we don't have any worse picks because it's the seventh round. You know, that's where you take your gambles like a rugby player that's never played football before. So we have the best pick, and I'm going with Mr. Irrelevant. I think this is the greatest Mr. Irrelevant of all time, Trey Quinn, wide receiver from SMU at 256 to the Washington Redskins. He had like 1,300 yards last year. He's uber productive. I think he's a tremendous slot wide receiver. I had a mock to the Philadelphia Eagles. I think he was their sixth or seventh round pick. Either way, uh, I think this guy is going to crack the roster. And when you look at what they have there, I would not be surprised in Washington if Trey Quinn can emerge as the backup slot wide receiver to Jameson Crowder. He is that good, that productive, great athlete. So... There you go, guys. That is a look at my best and worst picks round by round for the 2018 NFL Draft Class. If you agree or disagree with anything I said here today, debate me. Bring it. Fight me. If you think I missed anyone, if you have your own best and worst picks and players I didn't talk about, let me know about that as well. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, it's E4 saying like, subscribe, all that good shit, and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace out.